John chapter 11, verse 33. And the Bible says, therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. I want to teach today from a, a sermon titled A Picture of Compassion. A picture of compassion. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you have blessed us all to see. We give you glory in advance for what is getting ready to happen in this place. We ask now, Lord, that you would anoint our ears that we might hear what you are saying to your church. Lord, touch our mind that we might see the picture of compassion contained in your gospel and help us to embrace this picture, Lord, and to be this picture in our lives. We give you glory in Jesus name. We pray. Amen. Amen. A picture of compassion. A picture of compassion. When when we look at this particular text, um, what we have to understand is, is that Jesus is in the midst of his ministry. He has already been going through the region of, of Galilee and he's going through the region of Judea and he's ministering the gospel message to all types of people. And he has just finished basically explaining to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious folk. He had just begun to explain to them the difference between a, 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 a shepherd and a hireling. And he explains that uh, the flock of God, the people who, 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 who are God's people, they need a shepherd who would lead them into green pastures and not a hireling, someone who is hired, who might uh, leave them when times get tough. And so he explains that a hireling is someone that he sees the danger approaching and he does not stay to defend the sheep, but he flees to save himself. And Jesus explains that the shepherd is the one who is going to remain with the sheep and fend off every destructive force that might try to attack the sheep because the shepherd, that's the shepherd's responsibility. And Jesus declares, he said, I am the good shepherd who does this, who, who lays down his life for his sheep. And then he, he, he's moving out through the region and he gets to about the Jordan and while he's at the Jordan, he receives a message. Somebody comes to Jesus and they say, Jesus, Jesus, the man that you love has died. Lazarus, the man that you love has died. And Jesus is moved with compassion when he hears this good news. He's moved with compassion to the degree that he's willing to put his own life in danger just to show how compassionate he is. If you will write something down, I will have you to write this down because this is a timeless truth about Jesus. And this is what you will write. Jesus came because of compassion. Jesus came because of compassion. Jesus is, is at the Jordan where John the Baptist baptizes people when he hears about Lazarus' death. 
And Jesus stops for a second and he he remains in that place for two days. He's 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 stuck with compassion. But Jesus makes up his mind. He says, I have to get there. I have to be there with with Lazarus's family, Mary and Martha, who we taught about several weeks ago. Mary, the one who likes to sit at the Lord's feet and worship Martha, the one who likes to serve and move about and be busy. And 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 they had a brother named Lazarus who Jesus also loved. So once he hears about Lazarus in this sickness that led to death, Jesus said, I have to get to the family. I have to be there to comfort them. I have to be there to console them in this season that they're in because I came because of compassion. And and what we see in verse 35 is the shortest verse in the entire Bible. And I said it before, the shortest verse contains some profound revelation about who Jesus is. The verse says Jesus wept. He wept. And, and why he weeps, it, it's, a, it's the purest display of compassion. Because he sees Mary and Martha in their season of struggle and distress and frustration. And they have questions about what has just taken place in their life. And they're looking for answers. And they go to the Lord and they say, Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And nobody can ease their pain. And Jesus himself, our God himself, begins to be moved with such great compassion that tears flow from his face. At the sight of his people in distress. I would suggest that the, the only reason that Jesus left from the Jordan to get to Bethany where Mary and Martha lived because he was moved with compassion. And his disciples said, Jesus, if you go through Judea, the Jews that desire to stone you before, they're still there. And if you go through Judea, they're going to try to stone you. They're going to try to kill you. And Jesus told them, he, he basically said, I still have to get to Mary and Martha. Even if I have to put my life at risk to, to show compassion, to comfort and console this family, I'm going to be there. And so he moves with compassion in such a way just to comfort and console people who are dealing with loss. And I want to suggest that the only reason Jesus left from heaven to come to earth was because of compassion. See, Jesus, he's living in glory. He's living in eternity. He's he has nothing to do with time, but he looks down from heaven and he sees people who are distressed and frustrated and angry and resentful and bitter and under the curse and penalty of sin. And he moves with such compassion that he desire that he decides to clothe himself in flesh, step out of glory in eternity, come down here to to the dump that we call earth and be in the midst of his people simply because he has compassion for us he sees sheep without a shepherd he sees people stuck in bondage people stuck in in a depressed state people deprived of life under the penalty and the curse of sin and they can't help themselves so he decides to close himself himself in flesh step out of heaven and come down here because of compassion and, and we have to know that that Jesus came to be in our lives on, a, on our life in a personal way simply because of his compassion for us. And see, compassion is a deep sense of sympathy and sorrow for somebody who is experiencing misfortune. So anytime a, a person is grieving, a compassionate person might try to give them a hug to comfort them. Because compassion is not only weeping with somebody, but it's also being inspired to do something that would alleviate the misfortune and the pain of somebody else. So when somebody is compassionate and they go and see somebody who is sick, the first thing they say is, what can I do to help ease your pain? That's what a compassionate person does. When somebody is frustrated, a compassionate person works tirelessly to bring somebody peace just because they're in the midst of frustration. When somebody is, is in a desperate state and they're sad and they're weeping, the compassionate person tries to bring comfort and consolation just to alleviate the misfortune. 
And see, Jesus came solely because of compassion, solely because he had a desire to alleviate the pain and the misfortune and the discomfort and and all of the, the resentment and the things that are going on in our world. He came to alleviate this because of compassion. See, when we look at this world, what we have to realize is this world really lacks compassion. That, that's what we're seeing when you see young men lose their lives. When you see uh, police lose their lives, no, no matter what people, what, what perspective people use to look at our world, what we really see is a lack of compassion. Opposed to trying to do something to alleviate the misfortune and the pain and the hurt of somebody, people are not doing anything. And, and see, if Jesus would have just wept and that would have been it, then maybe we would be justified with just feeling the pain of somebody and not doing anything. Maybe we would be justified in watching the news, seeing these 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 murders and these killings and then turning off the TV and going back to sleep. Maybe we would be justified if Jesus only wept. But not only did he weep, but he made his way to Bethany because in his heart and in his mind, he said, I can't stand to see this happen in this world. I've got to move in such a way just to try to alleviate the pain, just to try to alleviate the discomfort. And we have to we have to do what what Jesus has done in our day and age, because God is looking for compassionate people who have a desire to alleviate the pain, who have a desire to alleviate the destruction, not to engage in the destruction, not to clap when somebody's life is lost, because the reality is no matter what perspective we lose, we have to take on the mind of Christ. We have to look at every situation through the eyes of Christ and say, that is a soul that is lost too soon. That is a life that was taken too soon. And God is saying, I need you to be a picture of compassion in these last days. He's talking to his people and he says, listen, I know your heart aches with concern, but I need you to start doing something. I need you to begin to move into the areas in which people are hurting and take them the gospel, the good news, so that you might alleviate some of the discomfort that they're experiencing. And we have to ask God, God, what do you want us to say? And God will speak back and say, just tell them about what I came for. Just tell them that when I came, I, I didn't just come to save one race or one ethnicity. Tell them I didn't just come to save those who were well off and wealthy. Tell them I didn't just come to save those who lived in Judea or the region of Israel. Tell them I came to save the world. Tell them that I was moved with such a compassion that I cried seeing the destruction that was working in their midst. That I wept because I seen life being taken and that was never my plan. Jesus was moved with compassion. And see, he was moved with compassion because he understands what we're dealing with. See, Jesus understands the pain that we experience. He understands the discomfort that we experience. He understands the frustration that has been building for years because we're continually looking at a world that lacks compassion. And we're trying to find answers to why in the world nobody wants to say anything with all of these lives being taken. How in the world can people be silent when lives are being lost? How in the world can people not begin to move into the areas to comfort those who are discomfort and to console those who are depressed and sad because their family is experiencing loss? Jesus said you have to be a picture of compassion because he was the purest picture of compassion in this context. He sees Lazarus situation and and he sees Mary and Martha experiencing pain. So he he presses his way to to Bethany. We don't know how many miles he walked just to comfort that family. But he made up his mind. He said, I'm going to get there no matter if I put myself at harm's way. I'm going to stand with Mary and Martha in this time that they're dealing with because I understand their pain. 
I can empathize what they're going through. I understand how how they 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 they, they missed their brother. That they, 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 their brother was gone, and and I understand that 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 they they're resentful, and maybe they're bitter, or maybe they're upset and frustrated because their answers have they have not gotten answers to their questions. But even in the midst of all of that, I'm just gonna make sure I am present in their in their midst. We have a, a work to do. We have a work to do. I was telling somebody that we have to be encouraged in this season because God is looking for people who are willing to display pure compassion to just say, you know what? I see you over there going through what you're dealing with, but I'm going to be with you. I, I might not have the resources to be with you physically, but I'm going to send prayers in your direction because I know what you're going through and I know what you're experiencing and I know how you feel. And therefore, I'm going to send prayer your way just to try to alleviate the misfortune and the suffering and the pain and the distress that you experience right now. We have to be a picture of compassion. As God's people, we are obligated to follow Christ, to be like Christ. And when I looked at this text, I see Jesus moving solely because of compassion. The Bible says that he wept. He didn't just weep because he, 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 he wanted to weep. He wept because he was moved with compassion to alleviate some pain and some distress that had happened. He came to bring healing to sickness. He came to, to bring joy to sadness. He came to bring relief to depression. Jesus came to be in our midst, to be in our lives. He came not only to Bethany, but he came to Virginia and he's coming to Suffolk and he's at our doors right now and he's knocking on our heart saying, I'm here with you even in what you're experiencing because I understand what you're going through and I'm here for you. And this is the gospel message that Jesus is telling us to go out into the world and teach. He said, just tell them that I'm here with them. When you when you tweet or when you send an Instagram or when you send something over social media, let people know that I'm here with them. You might be experiencing sadness, but I'm here with you. You might be afflicted in your body, but I'm here with you. You might not understand why this had to happen, Mary and Martha, but I'm here with you now. I'm on the scene and I've come to console you and to comfort you and let you know that the best is still yet to come, even though you may not be able to see past your situation. Jesus is a picture of compassion. The Bible says that he wept. But he pressed his way through just to be there for Mary and Martha to let them know that I'm here for you. The second thing I will have you to write down is this. Jesus came to call us to freedom. He came to call us to freedom. Now, I want to be very simple with this sermon. I don't want anything so creative, so deep that we can't convey it into the world. So when you leave, I want you to be able to explain that Jesus came because of compassion and that Jesus came to call all of us to freedom. That's what this thing is about. It's about being called to freedom. He came to liberate us from the power of sin and death, from the curse that had been working in our midst. We talked about Malachi and how the last word in the Old Testament was curse. And now we see Jesus moving in the earth in such a way to set captivity free, to liberate us from the chains of sin and death that keep us and hold us bound. He came to call us to freedom. And what's amazing is when you look at this text, Lazarus has already been dead for four days. He's already been dead for four days. His sister said, Jesus, you can't go in there. It already stinks. He said his body has already begun to break down. He, he has already started decomposing because he has been dead for some days. And even in the midst of that situation, Jesus goes to the tomb and he says, roll the stone away. He takes a look inside the tomb and he sees Lazarus dead. And Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. He speaks to Lazarus, even though he's in a dead situation. He says, Lazarus, come forth. 
come out of that lifeless situation. I can't stand to see you deprived of life. I can't stand to see you in a way in which I never destined for your life to be. I can't see you in that dead condition because that wasn't my intent. It was not my will that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance and make a turn. That all would experience the life that I have come to give them. He said, Lazarus, come forth. He called Lazarus to freedom, even though Lazarus had already been uh, dead for four days. And what we have to understand is Jesus has come to call us to freedom the same way he called Lazarus to freedom. He said, Lazarus, come forth. What we have to understand is that we have to develop an ear to hear from God. See, we have to make sure that we're in tune with God so that when God begins to speak to us, we can hear what God is trying to say to us. See, because even though Lazarus was dead and deprived of life, Lazarus still was able to hear the voice of God. So no matter what condition we are in, no matter how dead our situation may look, if we can hear the voice of God saying, come forth, come out of that situation, then we can enter into the freedom that he has for us because we just have to hear him call our name. And he's calling all of our names today. And he's calling us to come forward. He's calling us into freedom. He's calling us into peace. He's calling us into 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 health. He's calling us to move forward into our purpose. He's calling us to make a difference in the world. He's calling us to represent the picture of compassion that the world is looking for. But the question is, will we answer the call? See, if you if you if you can hear God speak to your heart. If you can hear God speak to your mind, if if God is speaking to your spirit and he tells you to come forth out of bondage, then you have to make up your mind and say, God, no matter what condition I may look like I'm in, no matter how dead my situation may look, God, I hear you calling me into freedom. So I'm stepping into what you have called me to enter into. So God is calling us by name saying, come forth out of bondage. Come forth out of sickness. Sickness doesn't have power to keep you bound. If I say come forward, then that means get up out of that sick situation and move into your divine healing because I have commanded you to come forward. He says come forward out of racism. Come forward out of bigotry. Come forward out of depression. Come forward out of resentment. Come forward out of confusion. Whatever it is that is keeping you bound, listen to hear God call you out of it. He says, come forward out of affliction and come forward out of drug addictions and come forward out of identity issues. I need you to come forward out of what is trying to keep you bound. But the question is, will we answer the call? Because God is calling us and he has something for us to do. He has he has some work for us to fulfill. He has a life that he desires for us to live. But we have to decide if we're going to listen to the voice of God. It says come forward out of shame. Maybe you've been dealing with regret. Maybe you've been dealing with guilt because of something that you have done in your past. God says come forward out of guilt. Come forward out of shame. Come forward out of regret and step into freedom. Can you imagine living your life with without any bondage keeping you? Can you imagine living your life completely free from every worry of this world? Just imagine living your life without being concerned with how the day is going to end or whether you're going to have enough food to provide or whether you're going to work enough hours to make enough money to pay rent or the mortgage. Can you imagine living life in complete freedom? God says, come forward into freedom. He says, stop worrying. Stop being concerned. Let it go. I'm calling you to freedom. But the question is, will we answer the call? See, because Lazarus, he had a choice to make. He heard the voice of God and he still had to respond. He could have said, I'm going to stay right here in this tomb. I'm going to stay buried by my burdens. I'm going to stay buried by my concerns. I'm going to stay burdened and buried in all of this chaos going on in this world. I'm just going to stay in the cave, in the place where, where people go when they have no life in them. 
despite the fact that Jesus called him to experience freedom. So we have to make up our minds and say, God, I'm going to answer the call to come out of this. I'm going to answer the call to step into peace. I'm, I'm going to answer the call to step into my healing. I'm going to answer the call to step into my purpose. God, I know I've made some mistakes, but you are not finished with me. You have something for me to do. There's somebody on this planet who needs to hear what I have to say, God. They need to hear the gospel from me because I'm unique in the way you have made me. And if I don't share the gospel, God, maybe they'll never receive it. And maybe they will be the next Lazarus who never hears the voice of God. Calling them to freedom. God said we have to be a voice. We have to begin to, to declare what Jesus is declaring in the world. We, we've got to look at people and say you've got to come out of that. You can't allow depression to hold you in bondage. You can't allow fear to stop you from moving into your destiny. You can't allow guilt to stop you from being who God has created you to be today. Forget what has happened in your past because God is not the God of the past. He is not the God of behind you. He is the God of what's in front of you and he desires to move you into your destiny. But we have to be declaring what God has declared. He says, come forward out of that. Just touch somebody and say, you got to come out. You got to come out. And, and the reality is some of us got to tell the church, you got to come out of the church. You got to come forward out of the church, into the communities, into the world, the way Jesus told us to do. He said, go into all nations, not into all buildings, not into all churches. He said, come out and go into all nations, into the world, teaching them the gospel. Letting them know that I came because of compassion and I came to call them all to freedom. We've got to answer the call and step into the freedom that God has called us to experience. The, the last thing I would have you to write down is simple. Jesus came to give us new life. It's simple. He came because of compassion. He came to call us to freedom and he came to give us new life. You see, and I'm telling you, it's some stuff in the details that we cannot miss. There's some things in the details that we cannot miss. Because in verse 44, in verse 44, the Bible says, And he who had died came out bound hand and foot. This is after Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. The Bible says, Lazarus came forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to him, said to them, the people, he said, loose him and let him go. We have to write this down. Jesus came to give us new life. See, and what we have to see in the details is that although Jesus called Lazarus to freedom, when Lazarus tried to walk in his freedom, he still was bound. He still had some, some grave clothes on. He still had some reminders of how dead his condition was. He still had something to remind him how deprived of life he had been. He still had something to remind him of the dead condition that he was living in. He still had something that would bring back memories about being in the tomb or being buried by the burden of his life. So Jesus said, he said, listen, I, he's, got some, he's got some things still connected to him. It's some dead things still connected to him. He said, but, but I've come to give him such a new life that there will be absolutely no trace of bondage. He said, I've come to give him a new life that has no form of bondage connected to him. He said, so, so loose him and let him go. Every form of bondage must go. Touch somebody and say, every form of bondage must go. Every form of bondage must go. Bondage from your past, bondage from your former relationships, bondage from your upbringing, bondage from your job, bondage from sickness. Every form of bondage must go out of your life because when Jesus says come out of, of this dead situation and walk into freedom, he sees that you're trying to come out, but it's still some dead things connected. So he has to declare over your life, loose him and let him go. Loose him. And let them go. And, and I tell you what's amazing to me is that Jesus says, loose him and let him go. But he never touches Lazarus. That to me is profound because Jesus doesn't loose him. Jesus doesn't 
unraveled the, the bondage. He tells the people to do it. He said, y'all who, who are here witnessing this, you who follow me, you who believe in the power that has just manifested, you who would be the believers, you who may represent the church, it is your job to loose them and let them go. And see, the reality is some people say, well, I don't have any power to set anybody free from the bondage that they're living in. Well, if Jesus commands you, then you have all the power you need to lose somebody and let them go. He says, you people who have seen the power manifest, you lose them and let them go. I'm not going to touch them. I just sent my command. I sent my word. I declared the good news that he can walk in freedom and that you have the power to lose them and let them go. Oh, my God, we're living in a time where we have to recognize the authority given to us. We have authority in this earth realm that Jesus is teaching us today. He says, you have the power to loose that one who is staying in a dead condition. You have the power to set them free. The one who is still wrapped in bondage, still trying to maneuver, but he's got the grave clothes on. Still the one who was lying in the tombstones, the one who was at the cemetery of his life because he is in a dead condition. You have the power to loose him. And let them go because I've commanded the power. So what God is trying to teach us is that with our tongue, with with the power of the word, if we confess the word of God, if we speak the word of God, if we say loose them and let them go then we will see bondage fall off of loved ones. We will see bondage fall off of our closest friends and we will see bondage fall off of people on our jobs. And it may not be something that is physical, but you don't know the type of chains that are being broken when you begin to declare freedom over somebody's life. When you begin to declare that Jesus said, come forth out of your situation. I didn't say it. Jesus said, he said, come forth out of this bondage. Jesus said, loose him and let him go. So I'm not operating in my own authority I'm operating in the authority of the most powerful God that only exists the Lord Jesus Christ and if he said loose him and let him go that when I speak into the atmosphere loose him and let him go that bondage of all forms must fall off so we have to speak into the atmosphere we have to speak into the spiritual realm and we have to declare loose them and let them go our young people, loose them and let them go. The black people, loose them and let them go. The white people, loose them and let them go. Every form of bondage that is trying to enwrap itself around God's people, we have to intercede on behalf of the nation and declare loose them and let them go. People who are stuck in, in abusive relationships, loose them and let them go, God. Those people who are who are dealing with identity issues, God, loose them and let them go in the name of Jesus. He says, I need somebody to begin to unravel the bondage in this world because I'm not going to touch them. He says, you have to do it. It is your responsibility to loose them and let them go. He said, y'all guys see Lazarus in the dead condition wrapped in grave clothes. I command you to loose them and let them go. Every chain broken, every shackle loose, everything that would keep us bound, Jesus said, loose them and let them go. Racism is taking place and, and taking root in people's heart in these days. Loose them and let them go, God. We declare by the authority of Jesus Christ that all bondage must fall off of your people. That everybody that we speak freedom over, God will experience that freedom. And if they get up and they're still bound, God will declare over their life, loose them and let them go. Our family, our loved ones. Those dealing with drug addictions and alcoholism and, and, and all types of, uh, of bondage. We're speaking over their life today. Loose them and let them go. Because Jesus called them to a new life. And this new life that he has called us to is an abundant life. It's a life of freedom. It's a life with no trace of bondage. It's a life where we are born again. 
That we no longer continue to be who we used to be. That we no longer continue to stay in the cave. That we no longer continue to lie down in a dead state of mind and in a dead state of activity. It's no longer a, a day in which we act as if we have no purpose or assignment from God or no responsibility for our neighbors in this world. Jesus said, loose them and let them go. I think that's speaking to all of us today. See, because maybe some of us came in here today without understanding what we're supposed to be doing in this world. Maybe some of us have have entered into the house of worship looking for clarity about our purpose and our destiny. And Jesus is trying to get us to understand that you have a very vital role to play in this in this thing that I'm doing. In my will, you have a very critical component to play in my will being done in the earth. Because even though I said Lazarus come forth, he still had bondage on him. And he needed somebody who was willing to take the time despite the stench, despite how he looked. Despite how he how his body had decomposed, despite everything that he was experiencing, somebody who was willing to roll up their sleeves and say, I'll take the bondage off of him. I'll lose him, God. If you declared him and to have freedom, then I'll play a role in his freedom and I'll be with him, God, even though he doesn't smell too good or he doesn't look too good. He doesn't have a nice suit on God. He doesn't look like he's a businessman. He doesn't look like he has his life together. God, but on a complete honesty, God, he looks as if he's coming out of a dead state. He looks as if he's leaving the graveyard, but I'll be there with him. I'll meet him in his situation. I'll go to the tomb where he's at. I'll go to the grave where he is lying and I'll declare, come forth and loose him in Jesus name. So we have an assignment to do. You see, the problem with the, the world is when these events uh, take place in which the, the world is looking for answers and they need leaders to step up. See, we, we really have the same strategy. And, and our strategy, if you if you really analyze, it has not been productive. It has not been fruitful because we continue to try to operate without God. We, we keep trying to create answers within ourselves as if man is really going to solve some of these problems. And we don't recognize that this is a spiritual battle, that it is wickedness in the atmosphere, that the spirit of death and the, and the curse of sin and death is operating all around us. So when we see people perish before their time, what we're witnessing is the curse of sin and death. And Jesus says, I have come that they might have life. I might come that they actually live beyond this meager thing that we call life on earth that that is capped out at 120. But my desire is that they might have eternal life that that beyond the grave, Lazarus, you can live again. That, that beyond the dead situation that might try to keep you bound, that I will open up the graves and call my people to me, even though they have been deprived of life on earth, they will live again for eternity. That's what salvation is. That's what, that's what we have to declare to the world. That, that this is not it. That, that you, you can try your best to have a good old time down here, but that's, that's a short time if that's what you're banking on. But but I'm trying to get you to understand that that God has new life for you to for you to be born again in the spiritual realm so that you might be uh, 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 liberated from the curse of sin and death and that you might live again in eternity. See, I want to conclude with this. We have to live our lives in such a way that we represent a picture of compassion. When people look at us, they should see the compassion in our hearts. They should see that we empathize with them, that we understand your pain and your misfortune. And we're going to weep and cry with you. But not only that, we're going to make our uh, mission, our life mission to ease your pain, to alleviate your misfortune. To play a role in your freedom. We are, we're coming wherever you are to call you to freedom. In the name of Jesus Christ. If you have a stone blocking you from freedom, we're coming and we're going to remove the stone. Jesus didn't remove the stone. He said, y'all guys, remove the stone. He's talking to his church in this day. 
he's saying we have to look as if we have something to offer to the world that we have to be confident in the gospel and in our own ability and our own assignment and our responsibility God says I need you guys I need you you might have thought you were small. You might have thought that you was unworthy. You might have thought that you was too imperfect, too flawed. He said, but that's who I need to remove the stones. That's who I need to say, come forth out of that bondage. That's what I need for somebody to hear, loose them and let them go. Because if you continue to allow doubt to, 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 to stand in the way of your destiny, somebody will stay behind the tombs longer than they're supposed to. And they may never hear me saying, come forward into freedom, come forward into peace, come forward into joy, come forward into hope. Somebody might stay in depression simply because we doubt the assignment on our lives, simply because we refuse to say, come forward into freedom and loose them in Jesus name. You don't have to worry. God didn't say it's your own authority. He didn't say it's your own might. He said, just say what I've commanded you to say. Loose them and let them go. Our world is grieving right now. People are hurting right now. Some people have lost all hope right now. And they need the gospel. They need to know that good news exists and that good news is available. But what they really need is somebody to carry the gospel to them and say, I understand that you're over there and you have some obstacles, some obstructions blocking you from hearing from God. But I'll remove the stone. I'll remove the stone from my own heart first so that I might even have compassion for you. And once we begin to remove the stones out of our own way, because not only was the stone blocking Lazarus, but the stone was blocking Jesus. And so some people in our life that are our loved ones and our friends, not only do they have a stone blocking them uh, from, from God, but there's a stone blocking us from them. And, and it's something that we have to roll out, whether it be skin pigment or financial situations or, 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 or culture, whatever it is that is blocking us from reaching out to those who are in the tombs. We have to roll the stones away. And begin to speak to somebody and say, come forward. God is calling you today. He says, come forward. So let us represent the picture of compassion in these last days. Let us go out into the worlds with the good news gospel. Let us walk in the authority that God has given us to declare freedom over somebody's life. And it might start with declaring freedom over our own life. Maybe we have to look into the mirror and say, you are free from the guilt, from the shame, from the regret. You are free from your past. You are not who you used to be. You can let it go. You can be uh, free and, and, and walk in liberty because who the sun sets free is free indeed. So let us begin to speak into the atmosphere and let us intercede for God's people and call them into freedom in these last days. As we close, I want to ask, is there one person who needs salvation? If there's one person who you may not be sure whether you are saved, I ask that you will come to the altar.